everyone. This is Rico Figliolini with the Capitalist Sage and my co-host, Carl Barham. Hey, Carl, how are you? I'm doing good, Rico. How are you doing? Good, good. Working from home like everyone else. I have my cat in the background, so if you hear the meows, this is from the cat. Um, but uh, the Capitalist Sage is on, as usual. We have a great guest today. I'm going to let Carl introduce him. Before we get to that, though, I do want to talk about our sponsor for the Family Podcast, and that's Hargrave Fiber. They've been a great sponsor of ours, a supporter of Peach Recorders Magazine that I produce. Uh, Hargrave Fiber is big in the Southeast, certainly big here in the metro area in South Georgia. They handle all the fiber optics for a lot of major companies and small businesses. So I've gotten to know them a little better. They are so involved in the communities that they go into. They are not your cable guy. So if you're looking for a fiber cable company to help you with your business connections, and provide support like you need to be able to do the teleworking that we're all doing or to work from you know, the uh, main office as we all go back into reopening. They're the people to, to talk to. Hargravefiber.com. I'll leave that with you. And Carl, why don't you take us into our guest today? Absolutely. Well, um, today I'm so honored to have Frank Cannon, an associate with Collier International Atlanta office here to talk about real estate strategies for small businesses that are navigating and dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic that's hitting so many businesses. We all know that um, the, the businesses have been hit hard, especially small businesses. And um, they were forced to close in many cases all across the country. And they have to still deal with these bills that are coming in including bills from landlords, um, bills from suppliers, bills from utilities. And so today we wanted to, to talk about some ways to approach understanding um, the landlord side of things, understanding the tenant side, and have um, um, Frank share some strategies and things that, that can help people work together and partner so we all get through this successfully. Hey, Frank, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, Carl. Glad to be with you all today. Oh, this is fabulous. Well, let's start off by just, you know, tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you get into real estate, commercial real estate in particular. So, um, like I said, my name is Frank with Colliers. We're in Midtown Atlanta. We're a full service commercial real estate firm. We help owners, occupiers, investors of real estate. And for me specifically, I help occupiers of real estate, office tenants with their whole real estate footprint whether that's they own a building, whether they lease two offices in Atlanta and Buckhead, or if they have a portfolio across the United States. And right now, what we are doing is helping clients with rent deferrals, rent forbearance, renegotiating their leases as this is as chaotic as it is. It's a very opportunistic time for companies to revisit what the real estate footprint looks like and how they can optimize that going forward in a post COVID-19 world. So I'm going to jump in with, with the first thing, just to kind of ground everybody that, that that's looking at this. Um, what, what have you been hearing the impact has been on landlords and tenants? Let's start with hearing from your tenants that you represent. Um, what are some of the things that they're dealing with and making decisions? And then we'll talk about things from the tenant standpoint um, that may have to deal with landlords. So the uh, initial the initial initial sentiment for most tenants, most companies is with like everyone else, a slowdown. You know, everyone has pulled back for companies and, you know, they budgeted accounts. They budgeted sales for May, for June. And simply some of that's not going to happen. And the sentiment for landlords is on the ripple effect is, well, tenants may make a quarter or half of their May or June rent as their sales slowed down. And overall it is, what can we do to solve this rent problem and solve this revenue problem and work together as a landlord and a tenant to ensure we all come out of this together. Um, communication has been great for a lot of tenants and landlords because at the end of the day, it's, we, we both, we're both, in the, we're all in the same boat and we are working to figure out how to best get out of this together. Yeah, and that's an important thing. 
not only on the on the pandemic health side, um, you've seen the theme that we'll get through this together, everyone. I think it's really important when you think about um, landlords and tenant. Um, so let's say I'm, a, I'm a, um, an operator of a retail shop in a shopping center. Um, and I know that I may have the ability to pay this month's rent, but I'm really concerned about paying the other expenses, maybe trying to keep some employees on, maybe being able to fund opening up again. Um, what are some of the things that I should be thinking about just as everything is closed down, I should be doing immediately? So number one right away is have that conversation with your landlord. Um, they, again, like I've said, they're, they're willing to work with you and you just kind of need to tell them, you know, this is what's going on. I have applied for stimulus. I have enough funds to keep my staff and here's, here's where I was pre COVID. Here's where I am now. Um, and your landlord, you know, they make it easy on them. Let them know you're working hard and what you need to put, to keep your boat floating. You know, maybe that is, maybe that's May and June. I'm going to need some help. I'll repay it back by the end of next year. You know, on the, on the other hand, if your lease is coming up soon, the last thing your landlord wants you to do is leave because no one's going to fill that spot given all the uncertainty. So there could be talk to talk to your real estate advisor, talk to your legal counsel. Uh, feel free to give us a call. You know, hey, what can we have right here to make sure that we survive three, four rough months and we can continue this partnership as you know the best piece of place in your shopping center, for example. What what are some of the mistakes you said? So that's interesting. Having that conversation in the case of where the lease is coming up within a six to one year period, right? Um, what mistakes do you see small business owners making when it's time for a lease renewal or asking for a new lease? And then bring it also into the context of with a pandemic COVID-19 happening where we don't know if something like this may happen again, where they have to shut down because of a, uh, an outbreak in a particular area. It may not happen everywhere, but it could happen in a zip code mm -hmm. where they have to for a week. What are some of the things, mistakes people are making when they when they try to negotiate that? So, a lot of a lot of small business up front, you know, it's not their world to think about the landlord's shoes. But at the end of the day, it is very tough for a landlord to fill an empty spot. There are costs to you know, you know if you had a if you were a pizza store and you're moving, and now the landlord wants a call it a hair salon in there, they've got to reconfigure the space. They have to market it. And then they have to and then they have to give the new tenant a, a reason to move in, such as, you know, free paint, free carpet or spru a, spru a spruce up allowance, if you will. On the other hand, if a, if a tenant just stays, that saves them a lot of money and a lot of headaches. A tenant has a lot of leverage to stay. So the first mistake is not asking for what they deserve to save the landlord a headache. And the tenant, you mentioned uh, now that we have a pandemic world going forward flexibility for any small business is going to be key. Um, instead of committing to a five year, we're going to see a lot more three year commitments because we're going to want the ability to get out sooner and with less headaches, look for more termination penalties. Maybe, Hey, if something comes up, I give you six months notice, Mr. Landlord, and I want to be out of here. And, you know, maybe a year ago, that'd be a harder push. But everyone at that table is going to understand what just happened. And with, again, we're, we're, we have common sense. You know that, yes, we can, put in a, we can put in a termination penalty into a lease going forward. Do you see, Frank, do you see a difference between maybe retail, office space, manufacturing space? Do you see a difference in those industries where there may be more leverage in one than in another? You know, in the past, absolutely. Um, you know, a retail, the, uh, you know, the, the dentist in the, uh, in the center, his practice is there, his clients are there. He's maybe done the braces for all three kids and their mom. Right. You know, he's, he's going to be there. Whereas office, you know, five, especially going forward, you know, more people are working from home. An office tenant may not be as inclined to stay in that place for 10 years that they've been. 
because now half their guys can half their guys and gals can work from home. And if there's a cheap plate, cheaper spot down the road mm. that satisfies their post COVID requirements, it can be free game. Again, existing landlord doesn't want that to happen. So we can ask for a better reason to keep that small business in their current building. There's something interesting. So when when we work um, with business owners and we look at their lease um, very often, uh, we get a good sense of what the price per square foot is for a particular retail spot or office spot. So we kind of know what the norms are. Right. But the, when those numbers came up, it was baked into an assumption of for a restaurant space that might be 1,400 square feet versus 2,800, how many people fit in there, therefore how much revenue you can generate that space. And a lot of commercial real estate, is, the, the value of it is based on the income it can produce. Correct. If for a period of time, folks are required to social distance in their place. So 40. How does that impact the price um, um, that they would a landlord can expect for um, the same space in new leases? So I think we're going to see. So I cut cut out for a bit. How are we going to see the the price for space be affected because basically the whole game's changed? So yep. I'll harken back onto my uh, original point of a uh, shorter term a three-year commitment versus a five. The thing is, the, we don't know the true appetite for the consumer to come back to these public spaces. You know, are they going to all of a sudden fill up, you know, a, a J. Alexander's dining room again? Probably not. It's, it's going to be more of a trickle. And same thing for, for an office. Is everyone going to run back into their dense open office space, we're probably going to return back in phases. Um, I mentioned this because we don't know what sales are going to look like in a post COVID world, what dining out percent demographics are going to look like. And you do not want to be locked into a rate that escalates for five years when we don't return to pre COVID levels for, for a while. And all of a sudden your rent's gone up three times. But, but that's that's one thing that, that I'm curious about, because if, if a business was generating a certain amount of revenue per month for the last five years in a space and, and not because of anything the business did. But you froze up, Carl, a little bit. I might have cut up. OK, where folks might have to today. Uh, in the five, last five years, they were generating a certain amount of revenue. Right. And because of the laws, they now have to cut the amount of people they can service, whatever whatever the business is. Right. So let's be – reality of it, if rents stay at the same level and revenue, the volume goes down, the all of these businesses – and it's not just one, many businesses are able to – um, sustain the same rent levels and it's Correct. okay to keep it that way, but a lot of businesses will, will probably fail in that model. If they do that, if someone was citing a new lease, um, do you think that there's, uh, there'll be a drag on the price per square foot? If this continues on too long there, I absolutely believe there'll be a drag on price per square foot, especially in the retail world because demand is simply not going to be there. Uh, it, every, owners of retail establishments are going to be prudent and nervous are my two key words. Um, you kind of hit it. We were doing so many sales with this much space and this many rules. We can't serve this many people and consumers are scared. That I would say is 99% of a rest, of a restaurant owner's mentality right now. Um, they're not going to want to pay pre COVID rents. And I'm, I'm not a restaurant expert. I can guarantee you the guys who are leasing these restaurant spaces probably think the exact same way, if not way more detailed on exactly what the new rent levels will be. And it's not going to be um, 
four four retail centers. They're all the same rent. One one restaurant's going to go in one over the other three. They're not going in either one right now at the levels because they can't afford it. And I think we will see a drag on a lot of retail rents and especially more reason to not commit to a five-year term during this during this time of uncertainty. Are, you want to argue for flexibility, argue for a, a reason to get out if things turn sour such as a pandemic, which no one would have seen before this before the time. You know, I was thinking about the every, – everything's location, 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 right? Right. So the, the place where a restaurant might be that might have been a hole-in-the-wall place or something like that, where they're, they have to be found, I can see those going low. Um, I could see sometimes certain certain areas, like let's say prime downtown areas, they're holding their strength a little bit because there's still people there, right? Uh, Cousins is opening up 20 malls. By the end of the month, they'll have 20 malls opened, reopened, I should say, across yeah, the country. Say. <laughs> no, no new malls. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. These are the reopening of the existing <laughs> malls, you know, like, like Gwinnett Place Mall, maybe the way the Walking Dead is being shot or something. But, you know, I don't know how many people will actually go to these malls. And, and so I can see certain types of properties really losing uh, their renters. Um, right. And, and maybe does it make a difference whether it's owned by a REIT in New York or whether it's owned by a local business in Atlanta? I mean, so I would say a little bit of both. But first and foremost, depends on your relationship with your owner. Um, I actually just read an article today. Uh, bad Axe, the uh, one of the owners of Bad Axe, his name is Mario Zalea. Mm -hmm. um, Atlanta was one of the first locations he reopened. As you know, Georgia was has pretty aggressive reopening rules. Um, he was able to talk to his landlord, and the conversation was pretty much the tune of, "Hey, man, this is tough for all of us. Stay safe. We'll get through this." Um, easy landlord communication hallmarks of any relationship doesn't matter you know if you've been paying the same guy for 10 years um and again it's it's all i mean it's the same thing in life you have a conversation you open it up if uh if you know you if you haven't have, haven't had that relationship or and you're not transparent with them your landlord may not be as willing to work with you and if you again you've been there forever the owner of your building or your center recognizes your value your tenancy and they, they want you to, they want, they need you there as much as you need to be there. Um, I would say it doesn't make a difference. Ownership it matters. The relationship. Yeah. If I could ask, um, we talking about retail and, and I'm curious of how business operations or business models are changing for office as well, because many people are being asked to work from home right. and, that's been happening in some form or shape for, for many years. But if we see a 20 point shift in the amount of people that work home, there's not as much need for office space mm -hmm. combined with the fact that we shouldn't have people in cubicle farms as dense where a guy next door might be coughing a lot and, and all of that's going to create some dynamic. How can businesses shift the way they use their office space or models. So I think we going forward, we will not recognize the uh, the office going forward. And this pandemic expedited the timeline. Um, we can argue that the last big change was get everyone getting dense. You know, you see the old law firm. It's all private private offices, big wooden desks. You know, you've got ten people in a whole floor just to be just to be exaggerating and then we we shifted to the we work of the open office where you had 10 people in 100 square feet mm -hmm. um i think this is going to spur a move back towards less dense social distancing will be implemented in the office where you know different teams have their own section so if one gets sick everyone goes home and they're six feet apart and this will be a great time for a business owner to reevaluate how much space they need because you may have figured out your sales team can do a lot more at home than you previously thought. You may have discovered that, hey, 
my top two engineers only need to come in twice a week. They don't need their whole wing. Um, Employees will love to hear that, but I'm wondering what, do, how do we, how do we resuscitate the, all the managers that you just put into cardiac arrest where they can't walk down the hall and see all their people huddle over a computer looking busy. Let, let's even stop there for a second. Cause I saw something come across the news and Kemp has extended the state of emergency, public state of emergency through until the middle of June and is extending the stay at home for certain populations. So just to let you know. Well, see, Different yeah. It was yesterday. Or Great breaking week. news and, and impact the conversation. Um, Fantastic. Well, <laughs> so with, with that in mind, it's I think it's just going to emphasize that a work from home policy is now going to be essential to any company going forward, whether that is a digital check, a Zoom check in, whether it's a phone call, whether it's just an email conversation. How are you doing on your projects? Um, but now, again, we just we have another month and a half to ensure people are being productive and what and. You know, maybe we have another podcast where we determine how these digital check-ins happened. But at the end of the day, either we fi teams figure out how to work from home for an extended period of time, or they're, you know, things may not get done, and that's just not ideal for anybody. You know, I've been listening to some companies uh, that have been putting out if you if your work can be done from home, then you need to do it at home. Right. Because they're going to fear, right? The news is all talking about fear and people going back to work, being forced to go, quote, forced to go back to work because it's open, right? And stay at home is, is gone. That means you should be able to go back. So liability, where do you put the kids? Kids are out of school. There's no um, summer camps. All these, all these aspects. Even if you go back to work, how are you going to deal with the individual office spaces and the common areas? Right. We, you know, the kitchen areas and all that. So, I mean, it's just, it's going to be a mess no? So we've, um, we've actually, we're, we're working on a, uh, the reentry guide, reentering the work, the workplace and got a couple, one of the main points we hit on is beefing up your office's cleaning schedule. Um, you know, common areas, like you mentioned, the lunchroom, you know, we, you may have to start your cleaning expense may go up twice, twice as much having someone come in and disinfect doors, refrigerators, tables, chairs, people touch. That's, that's now our new normal. Yeah. I could see, I don't know if you've ever got into some workspaces that don't have touchless um, um, toilet flushers and sinks. And, you know, it, obviously it's, 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 it's gone everywhere, but you go into them now and you got to wonder what's going on. Right. There's technology that can be, played or force a shift. And I'm wondering businesses that are in that market, installing, implementing those things might be seeing some demand coming be as you people don't want to touch things and we have to start figuring out ways to exist in this new in this new world um, in space. So besides the obvious one of toilet paper, I would say uh, Everything digital, you know, the companies, Zoom, WebEx, um, and like you mentioned, touchless technology, doors that, you know, open motion sensing doors, all retrofitting companies to make this workspace healthier. Mm -hmm. I feel like those will see demand all over the place. It's interesting. Um, I was chatting with a lady who run, who was one of her biggest clients is Home Depot's paint department. And they've been going crazy because a lot of people are home. What are they doing? Home improvement projects. And yep. um, she was actually in a place up in Cumberland and the space next to her was empty and they do a lot of on-site training. And we were having a conversation that they may want to look at that space just used for a training room, training employees. They're one of the bigger offices in Atlanta. Two months have gone by, business is booming. They're training companies on Zoom. You know, now all of a sudden they they found out they can do more with less. And it's just that's one of the countless examples that changes. This is just expedited change. I, I work at a newspaper in Sandy Springs and same thing. We put out two two papers all, all online 
And so his 15, 1,500 square feet will probably drop down to maybe 700 square feet. Yeah, absolutely. And all, and you're going to save a lot of money that you can now put towards other avenues of your business. Yeah. What, um, just out of curiosity, now you're, you're reducing your rent expense by half. What are you going to invest in or what are some wish list items for the, for the, for the newspaper? <laughs> well, see, now there's the problem though, right? It is a newspaper and it's sort of an industry. Now my magazine is, works out fine because of where we are, but some publications are falling by the wayside. Right. Uh, neighbor newspapers out in the cabin Marietta, they might as well close up. I think the last issue was six pages. So, I mean, they just might as well close. Um, some other publications are doing their stuff, but even online, uh, Curb Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, I think people know curb.com. Well, every city sort of has their own curb Atlanta.com. <laughs> Curb Atlanta let go of all its people from what yeah. I yeah. So even wow. online companies are seeing this issue. So it's. So it's, it's interesting, Rico, you mentioned about location, location, location. When we talk real estate. That has been the paradigm for as long as I've known um, anyone in. Re so think about office building. If you're a fancy law firm, where do you want to be? You want to be in Midtown on 14th Street. Um, um, if you're retail, you want the Apple Store. The Apple Stores are only located in 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 high dense retail areas mm -hmm. um, type of thing. Is there a shift that that this may be accelerating, where location? is probably not as important put on businesses as the premium that's put on businesses for location now shifts to something else. And, and I don't know if you've heard of the building, the edge in the Netherlands, it is the greenest building in the world, but what it, what it highlights is a technologically advanced building that has sensors everywhere. And what they built was a building where you want to be there because technology drives the value of the business, the building, and more than the physical location. And so I could see, and I know the technology exists. I've, I've seen it. Um, you've seen it in movies where, With the where you, every, you can measure the temperature of people in the room down to the individual. You see it in the movies when – they see the hot spot and they drop the bomb on that place with 12 people. And you can see, well, that technology is, is not that difficult to deploy in building. So if, if you know, a co-worker's temperature is up three degrees, there might be a way to, to, to indicate that that room may have a problem. Yes. What do you think about investing um, in these technologies? And these and things, for those types of things in place. Investing in, you cut out there for a bit, investing in these technologies. Yeah, to, to attract new tenants. Ten landlords have been living on location. Right. And now, now the question is, do they have to shift and, and shift their business model to leverage technology mm. that now addresses safety as part of... So I, I primarily think for the... For the retail and the industrial worlds, it's still going to primarily be location. Um, you're going to put, you know, example, Amazon last mile distribution centers. Mm -hmm. They're they're going to base that decision on location. At the Apple Store, they're still going to want to be in a high traffic area. Um, office sector, I think you hit on it. We're talking about the edge. It's not. It's going to location will lose importance. It's not going to be about where the space is. And how much, how big it is, but the quality. There's going to be an emphasis on quality. Um, two, two big, two big reasons that just pop into my head. One, um, everyone's going to want it to be clean. Everyone's going to want it to be sterile. Everyone's going to have social distancing. These self-opening doors. Um, that's going to be on the forefront of anybody who goes into the office a lot. Two, we're going to. I think overall, we're going to see less people go into the office as much. Not drastically, but over time, there will be less people going to the office nine to five, given what happened. So you're not going to need as much people in there. But when they do go in there, what are they going to want? They're going to want they're going to want the uh, the AC to change depending on how many people are in the room. 
Mm -hmm. They're going to want the Internet of Things to know, oh, Carl's here at 8.30. He likes his latte at 8.45 delivered from the Insight Starbucks. Carl, would you, it, text, it texts your phone. Would you like your Starbucks? Yes or no? Rico and Carl are in a meeting with three people. Um, we don't need to waste you running on full blast because it's a conference room for 10. We only have three in there. Internet of Things re recognizes that from your Outlook calendar. This technology is there. Um, and... I, again, this will just only expedite it and going forward. People will want better, safer, more technolog technologically advanced space as opposed to the location premium. You know, it's funny when you think of Tesla, for example, right? The, the big, one of the biggest things in there they, t they talk about is the, um, is the filtration system in Tesla's that it's actually better than let's say n95 you could be if there's something outside the car and you close yourself in you would be safe from it right because of the filtration system on it um these could be and they're working with uh i think it's resmed now to make um to make those um filtrate the um what do you call it? the ventilators that right. are working mm -hmm. with the company doing that um that's based out of atlanta i think but I, I agree with you, Frank. There will be changes and stuff, but I think it also depends on what that business and specific is, right? If you're a service sure. business that you could do anywhere, that makes less of a big deal where you're geographically. Like you said, if you're an Amazon and you're that last mile fulfillment, certainly you want to be near transportation, likely uh, a hub like Atlanta, if not a micro. Yeah. To, uh, to take a step back, I just remembered. So I'm sure are y'all familiar with the LEED certification system for buildings? Yep. Yes. How, how energy efficient something is. There's LEED Gold, LEED Platinum. There's also, I think we will see an explosion. There's a, there's a relatively younger standard. It's called the WELL building standard. Hmm. And it basically rates how healthy a building is for its employees. Things, you know, how much natural light are buildings getting? What's the fitness center like? How many times has the air changed? Um, I think we will see that explode and that will take a larger spotlight in decisions going forward. You know, maybe only the, the Tesla health advocates knew about how many air changes per 1000 people were happening on a floor that I think stuff like that will start to take a major spotlight. There, there might be one other interesting thing when we talk about technology, especially mobile technology, all the apps that allow you to check into a location or you walk into a store and it sends you a coupon to your phone, tracks your Bluetooth. Um, I could see that being used in a different application now. If uh, a salon um, has a customer that five days later tests positive for COVID-19, they have the ability to know everyone that um, came into that salon it, it could be as simple as there is a credit card transaction to more sophisticated where you walk into some businesses or gyms and you literally have to check in with an ID or your phone. So it knows you were there and it can go and identify all 300. That's almost like those uh, gyms, right? With the passes that you go into. With the passes, exactly. Yeah. So contact tracing could become easier because you could find and message 350 people that have been in that space or interacted with somebody from the time the person that tested positive, and they can get a notification to go to their testing center and get tested and self-isolate. Now, hmm. you, that technology exists. Small business owners are thinking about that. But I could think of some companies, point of sale companies, others that could diverge into these areas and offer this to give clients comfort, customers comfort that that there's something that's helping control this as they go into space. Do you, Frank? Do you see? I, I can see that, and I can. You, you're familiar with like Simply Safe and the Nest thermostats and stuff like that, right? Right. Smart technology. Right. All those are plug and play, pretty much in a home i mean i can i can also see maybe commercial space being like that right because a lot of that is plug and play a lot of that doesn't cost a lot of money because it's either using bluetooth or wi-fi technology to communicate and modulize and put into different rooms in in an office suite right i mean 
we, we were seeing some of this technology at Smart Expo last year. Yes. Um, the, 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 they're, they're putting the sensors in lights and. Yeah, and they're, they're okay. going to be coming out at some point this year too, the Smart, Smart Expo. The, um, the most, I haven't seen it in person, but the most common that I've read about is um, it's a sensor in your employee ID badge. You know, the one that you use to, get, you know, get up, you swipe in the elevator, it takes you to your floor, and then you buzz that in to get into the, your, if your yeah. office has a security system. And there's sensors that know, you know, this is Carl's workplace. This is, this is Carl has a, an appointment at three. And again, the, the sensors know how many people are in a conference room, the lunchroom at any given time. Um, maybe we get to that to where it's on your phones as well. Well, I've got a question that comes back to um, dealing with, with the current state that folks are going. I've heard of some cities partnering right. with, with major landlords um, that where tenants, where landlords that give deferral get some kind of recognition and or benefit for that. Have you seen that? And can you describe how that really works? Right. For two, you know, real close to us, Sandy Springs and Peachtree Corners. Um, you know, so I get their alerts all the time just trying to stay connected. And Peachtree Corners was offering yeah, for any landlord that offered their tenants a 60 day rent deferral, a free showcase as a community partner. Really, you know, they get better advertising opportunities. Just really a focus on you helping the city, helping these businesses um survive and thrive during these tough times and for sandy springs um sandy springs perimeter chamber was offering a free advertising slot for mother's day specials during this crisis i mean mother's day is right around the corner these, these days all blur together and that's typically a uh you know that's that's a big big sales event for some companies and these are just few of the examples of a lot of people a lot of companies landlords cities all coming there to try to make things happen during this tough time. Guys, I think we're uh, towards the end of our time together. Carl, did you want to? Yep. yep, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, I want to thank you um, so much, Frank, for joining us today and, and sharing some of your knowledge about um, real estate and how to deal with tenant, uh, tenants and landlords. Um, uh, really helpful information to do that. Um, uh, how would people reach out if they wanted to, to, to ask you questions? What's the best way to get in contact with you and learn more? Uh, honestly, I would say just shoot me a text or email me. Um, so I'm frank.cannon at colliers.com. And then, I mean, shoot, shoot me a text at 404-597-5737. If it's anything from, hey, you know, my lease is coming up in three, five, six months. I don't want to leave, but... I'm not sure what to do to make a decision going forward. Or if you're, you know, you might be struggling for May or June rent. Um, you know, this is, this is a headache. This is a, this is a time suck for a lot of business owners who have a million things to worry about right now. Um, and for us, this is our job and it's a free service for tenants to occupy space. Um, just give us a shout and we can, let's have a conversation. We'll negotiate with your landlord on your behalf and see what we can do get through this together thank you so much for that um and and we do recommend um get in touch with, with real estate professionals if you don't know how to negotiate with your landlord um but it's as simple as picking up the phone and having a conversation you're both in partnership you both got to work through this together and you got to figure is you're typically in a contract for a number of years um, I'm Carl Barham with Transworld Business Advisors of Atlanta Peachtree. Um, we're working a lot with business owners in this time to help them figure out ways and strategies to continue to, to improve their business um, and, and help think about um, different scenarios and where they may, they may want to exit the business. Right now, it's about surviving, but it is the best time to start planning on, on your exit strategy for your business, and you can contact uh, me at 770 768 
766-9855 or kbarm at tworld.com if you want to talk to myself or, or one of our other advisors to help you navigate through this and, and, and talk about your exit. Rico, how about yourself? What do you got coming up um, in these upcoming months? Sure. So we're working on, we're actually working on the next issue of Peace Street Corners Magazine, the June, July issue. Um, it's going to be chock full of a lot of stuff in there dealing with what's going on now. Some great stories that we're going to be telling about what people are doing during this COVID-19, how they're repositioning themselves a little bit during this time, because a lot of people are just home. Not that they're not doing anything, we all should be teleworking, right? But uh, some people are just pivoting mm -hmm. if they own their own business or they're doing a gig economy and they're trying to figure out what to do uh, with that. So the magazine will be coming out the first week in June, I believe, is the way we've said it. Um, and if me personally also doing Mighty Rockets um, in social media and podcast, I'm doing a lot more podcasting with Carl and a bunch of other people. Uh, doing a lot of branding, a, a lot of online uh, social media, a lot of video work, um, doing it socially safe. So if you need me, MightyRockets.com, if you need anyone to help you with production or social media content or branding, uh, or you can call me or text me, 678-358-7858. So here we go. Well, thank you so much, Rico and Frank. Um, uh, really appreciate you joining us and give us some, some really good tips and insights that hopefully um, you. Hopefully we'll be there at some point. The business owners that well, reach out. It was great. Thank you again for having me. Thank you, Carl. And thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.